You're listening to the SSPX Podcast, and welcome to episode 14 of the Crisis in the Church series. We're joined by Father John McFarland, the prior of Our Lady of Sorrows in Phoenix, Arizona, for this final episode in our study of modernism. Today, we'll look at modernism through the lens of the recent encyclical by Pope Francis, Fratelli Tutti, and how this encyclical promotes the French revolutionary ideas of liberty, equality, and fraternity. We'll see how these three ideas, though they sound very nice, are not based in Catholic doctrine, and in fact were condemned by Pope St. Pius X just over 100 years ago, when French Catholics formed the Sion, a very popular Catholic social movement. This movement was flawed and condemned because it tried to marry the principles of the revolution to the kingship of Christ. If you'd like to learn more about the series we're doing on the crisis in the church, or go back and revisit our previous 13 episodes, or if you want to support this project, please visit sspxpodcast.com slash crisis. Now, here's Father McFarland. Welcome back to the SSPX podcast and our next episode on the crisis in the church series, welcoming uh, Father John McFarland. Hello, Father. How are you? Hey, well, Andrew. How are you? Oh, I'm doing fairly well today. And we are wrapping up our last episode on modernism. And today we're talking about um, the Sion, uh, the apostolic mandate, our apostolic mandate, uh, and Fratelli Tutti. And these are three distinct things that we're discussing today under the broader topic of social modernism. So when we talk about social modernism, how is that distinct from modernism itself that we've been talking about for the last four episodes? Well, modernism itself is is more doctrinal, I would say, dealing directly with, with religious questions, uh, with the whole idea of, of religion, of, of dogma, of, of how religion comes about. Um, social modernism is more the practical application of the, the same ideas, the same basic tendency to social questions, the, the interaction of human beings in, in the broader society. Okay, so let's start with the first topic on in this discussion, Father, and that is the Sion. Uh, what is that? What movement where, was that, and, and when did it get started? So it got started in the the last decade of the of the nineteenth century, uh, in 1894, I believe, by a Frenchman named uh, Marc Sonnier, and it was a uh, a Catholic action organization uh, inspired by Leo the Thirteenth's encyclical Rerum Novarum, trying to apply Catholic principles to, to social questions, the question, interaction of capital and labor, uh, governments, democracy, all these kinds of things. Um, and it did stray from that original intention, uh, becoming a, a, having that influence of, you know, whether direct or, or indirect of, of modernism and, and liberalism on its way of thinking. Um, and that, Led to them trying to to marry the principles of of, of the revolution of, of of liberalism with uh, with Catholic principles, which obviously cannot be done, and it, it brought about the their, their condemnation by Saint Pius X in an encyclical title of which we, we translate as our apostolic mandate, and that came about eighteen ten. So so this was a at the very beginning this was a a, a good object it was it was trying to restore some of the social kingship of christ the king um right. that that Leo the 13th had had suggested um but it got infused with with this modernism that was rampant at the time and, and it was a very popular movement back then wasn't it right half a million members at its peak uh, in france wow. so it certainly had a great influence and you see that it must have been important if uh, if St. Pius X took it upon himself to write an encyclical to to condemn its principles. Certainly, so so, so the influence. Sion is the Sion is is the background information for what we really want to talk about today, which is our apostolic mandate, and then we're going to be comparing that with Fratelli Tutti right. by Pope Francis. Okay, right. so what is it that Pope St. Pius X uh, condemned? What was it that was that he was attacking really? Um, well, various things. <laughs> Certainly, the but the this doctrine of of the Sion that that was infused, especially with naturalism, uh, and right. naturalism is that that philosophical error that denies, whether directly or in practice, the existence of the supernatural, and that you know that can be as the you know the the modernist is is agnostic. He says that we uh, we can't know anything with 
any degree of certainty beyond what we can perceive with our senses. And so that effectively eliminates the, the supernatural um, as a, a as we understand it in the Catholic Church, at least. Uh, and then you have the, the sort of practical naturalism that carries on human life in whatever sphere with no reference to the supernatural acting effectively as if it does not exist. And that's that's more the the problem of the Sion. It's not that they're saying there is no such thing as as grace. There is no supernatural life. But for the purposes of of social life of human beings, we we're not going to refer to those things. We're going to leave those aside. Those will be a matter of of our private devotional life when we go to church, when we say our prayers and so on. So very similar in a sense to what was happening at the foundation of the United States that we studied with Father Loop and Americanism. There was, there was Locke's idea of, you know, separating man's personal religion to his public actions in the state. Right. And that's, a, it's a basic tenet of liberalism as well. This naturalism underlies most of our major modern errors, liberalism, a Freemasonry even is, is steeped in naturalism uh, and so on. And one of the consequences of it, too, is the, the the denial effectively or the acting as if it doesn't exist in regard to, to original sin. So we end up with this utopianism. We can build a, a magnificent society here on Earth that's effectively perfect, that's just and harmonious for, for all men everywhere uh, without any reference to God, to to his church, to grace. Wow. So... This is this is already starting to, to ring some alarm bells in, in my head when and I know we're going to be getting into the discussion between Fratelli Tutti and, and, and this. But already this idea of this utopia, most of the encyclicals that have come out in the last 15, 20 years have been, well, at least in the last five years, have been about ecology and climate change and, and those kinds of things. It's all about right. do, the here and now. Us towards yeah, towards the, the a perfection of life on Earth without mm-hmm. reference to the transcendent, to the supernatural. Wow. Right. We even see that, you know, Pope Francis is the the um, has the full extent of that naturalistic view. But it's it's there. And John Paul II is talking about, you know, building a civilization of love and, and that kind of thing. Are we are we talking about the church? Are we talking about grace? Are we talking about even with our Lord Jesus Christ or about something else? And it would seem about something else. Right. Another thing, going back to the Sion that they took up as sort of a motto was the same motto, the same trinity that the French Revolution took up, which was liberty, equality, fraternity. Uh, and and it's, it's surprising to me when I learned that they did that because that seems to me such a liberal thing that they wouldn't do it. But they tried to kind of baptize that, that slogan from the French Revolution and, and put it into practice. Is that right? Right. And you have that going on uh, among certain Catholics throughout the 19th century. And, uh, you know, what's what became known even at the time as liberal Catholicism um, or Catholic liberalism, however you want to look at it. But we can take good things from the revolutionary ideas and sort of um, square them one way or another with uh, the Catholic faith such that they are acceptable. Um, and, you know, the the problem is it's 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 a slogan. Right? We in revolutionary ideas are always couched in very high sounding, you know, nice things. They're not going to say we're, we're in favor of death and destruction and the overturning of the social <laughs> order and the, the overthrow of the church. They say liberty, equality, fraternity. You know, doesn't that sound great? Uh, but they, what they understand by those things is not what, what the church understands by those things insofar as their, their laudable goals. Uh, you know, when we speak about the liberty that men should have, we don't mean what liberals mean. When we speak about the right sort of equality among men, we don't mean what the liberals mean. And we don't fraternity. We don't mean the same thing either. And so to use those words is to at very least sow the seeds of confusion in the minds of the faithful. So I guess, is it is it helpful for us to go through those three topics one by one and kind of compare what Pope St. Pius X said and what Pope Francis said? And, and we're looking at um, our apostolic mandate with Pope St. Pius X and then Fratelli Tutti with Pope Francis. Right. And we should point out, too, that, that uh, you know, the Sion took up the this motto of the French Revolution, but so does Pope Francis. Uh, he uses the words yeah. explicitly in, in Fratelli Tutti. He has it. It's a heading um, for a section in the in the encyclical. And he, he speaks about it, um, not necessarily at length, uh, except on the subject of fraternity. That's, that's really what he wants to talk about. Um, but he is again, attempting to, to baptize these, these revolutionary concepts. Wow. 
So I, I guess we'll start with with liberty. We've we've talked with Father Ruder already about about liberty, and we've talked about the the thirteenth encyclical Libertas and, and the proper understanding of those. Um, but in this context, when we're comparing and contrasting uh, fratelli tutti with our apostolic mandate, what are the main distinctions we can see? Well, I think we can point out firstly that the you know, the modernist is uh, is obsessed with the with the idea of liberty because of a a focus very much on the individual. So the primacy of the individual, uh, good things issuing forth from his own his own consciousness, his own religious sentiment, including the truth. So men can't be constrained by outside forces. They have to to be free to express themselves religiously and otherwise uh, in in pursuit of their their particular dignity, right? which is uh, you know in in this process of, of vital imminence, as the, the modernist uh, would express it, you know, religion and truth coming forth from man's inward consciousness. So no restrictions can be imposed uh, upon that. And so what exactly do we mean by liberty? That's, that's the, the, you know, the big question. Uh, and, you know, the church in, in through Leo the 13th and the encyclical Libertas, he points out the different kinds of liberty, you know, the, the faculty of free will, the absence of physical constraint, but then also moral liberty, which is true liberty, the, the freedom to choose things that are in fact good. Um, and so that's that's the liberty that 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 we seek. Um, but that's the goodness of something to, that we're choosing is is founded on on the truth of what's good for for nature as human beings, as created by God, and in reference to our supernatural goal. And the modernists and the liberals are not going to recognize that. And, and it, it, this idea of liberty, you said, you know, modern, modernists are obsessed with it. And it's even in some of the uh, declarations from the Second Vatican Council as well, dignitatis humanae. I mean, that's, that's about liberty. Right. In the wrong sense. <laughs> right. And that, you know, men are not to be constrained in any way from the public practice of, uh, of their religion. Um, and that's not what the, what the church has historically taught, you know, right. that, that, you know, Religion is is good insofar as it is true. You know, so a false religion, insofar as it is false, is is a problem for man, and it's not able to save his soul. He needs the, the true religion. So to stop the spread and so on of uh, of false religions, to stop their proselytization, to stop their public displays, is not is not bad for human beings. It's it's good for them because it has a reference to their the goal of their actual existence, as willed by God. So then, after liberty, then we get to equality. And how do the how does the modern church see that versus what Pope Saint Pius X said? Well, a, you know, Pope Francis and and the modernists see it as uh, as the modern liberal sees it. You know, that, that um, you know, putting everybody more or less on on exactly the same plane. Right? Nobody is, has should have privileges. Nobody should have special rights, special duties. We should we should all be equal. Uh, and that, even on the face of it, is absurd. There are all sorts of differences that are simply built into our nature that, you know, if we say different, we say unequal. It doesn't mean that one is necessarily better than the other, but they're still not, not equal. You know, for the, the modernist, again, that's, that's important because they don't want any truth, especially any religious truth, imposed from without. Right? The, it's, it's not the role of authority to, to teach us. We, we have to have the religious experience ourselves and come to our, our knowledge of the truth. We might have some things come from our equals on the outside. We, we share our experiences. We have newer and better and, and more exciting experiences or whatever it is. But, but ultimately, that, that truth rests within our own consciousness, within ourself, not in its correspondence with an objective reality that is taught to us from the outside by God, by his church, or by anyone else in authority. All right, something you said, I'm going to, I'm going to pick up on father. And that was that, that we have differences, but for the modern, for the modernists, for modern man, different equals unequal. That didn't make sense, but being different means to the modern man, not being equal. And that's not the case. Being different is, is dif just different. It, it's not the same. Right. Well, I mean, we're not equal if we're, right. if we're different, but that doesn't mean that we're, that one is, is necessarily better than the other or on a higher plane 
Um, certainly not their different, their different levels. For example, you can, you can have a higher rank in the church. You know, you can be a bishop or the Pope, but it doesn't mean that you're the, the best person. It doesn't right. mean that you're holiest. It doesn't mean that, that God loves you the most. Uh, so there, there are all sorts of inequalities that are just naturally built into, into society. Some people are smarter than others. Some people are stronger than others. Uh, people are, have different capabilities, different, different backgrounds. And that's not, there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's normal. Um, the idea that we should level everything out and, and, uh, especially in the, on the realm of, of results, you know, whether you are smart, um, or stupid, you should be able to have the same job, whether you work hard or don't work hard, you should be able to have the same pay is, is an absurdity. And it, it should be on the face of it, but we see the logical conclusion of that in the world around us, where we try to give everybody the same thing, no matter what they've done or what they're capable of doing. And when you try to make everything equal when it's actually not, it's, it's, a, it's a sin against justice, in the sense, because that is not the way things are, are meant to be. Uh, we are not all, we're, we're all equal in the fact that we all have an immortal soul and that we're all created by God. Right. Uh, right. But in reality, that's about where it ends. We have different duties. We have different rights. We have different dignities. Uh, and that's and that's been abolished in the modern world. Right. Or that they they try to. It's it's impossible right. to right. actually right. abolish it. <laughs> right. And for some of them, it's just a tool to to build themselves up and increase their own power, prestige and fortune and uh, and what have you. Um, but yeah, it, it is. It's certainly an injustice. Right. Th those who have worked harder should be paid more or those who have produce the better result. Um, and, you know, those who have the capability should be put in authority, not just anybody, you know? Uh, so, um, you know, the even rights and duties are going to be different based on those capabilities, based on our place in society, based on our, our knowledge, our wisdom, our strength of will, our physical strength, whatever it might be. After liberty and equality, then we get into the third third item, which is fraternity. And I'll confess, this is something that when I hear it, I, I hear fraternity and I kind of get what it means, but I don't really know what fraternity means, uh, I, I guess, on, on the liberal side of things. Um, you know, liberty makes sense, equality makes sense, but fraternity, it's, well, we're all brothers. But what do the, what do the modernists say that fraternity is? That's a good question. Uh, modernists don't like to give definitions that, that pins them down too much, but it, it's just really a sort of generic respect uh, and mutual cooperation and concern for our fellow man that doesn't really seem to be founded on, on a whole lot. Um, and it is, it's, it's entirely naturalistic in their view. It's, it's not Christian charity. It's not animated by grace. It's not animated by the imitation uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ and, and so on. Right? We're, we're told it's, it's based on the dignity and the worth of, of every human person. St. Francis, St. Francis, Pope Francis says, uh, and it has to be, you know, cultivated assiduously or there's no hope for the future of humanity. And, um, our, our politics, our economics, our, we have to have a solidarity. They all need to, to be animated by this great spirit of, of human fraternity. Um, but what exactly that means, he does make a token reference to the gospel, saying that for, for Christians, the notion of fraternity comes from the gospels, but others draw their sense of fraternity from, from other places. Right? And it's different. It's fundamentally different than, than charity, which is concern for others, which does do good for others, but it's, it's to be rooted in the, the charity of God for us, right? Again, based on, on our nature and our ultimate goal. Can we say that we really love someone if we don't have a concern for the, that person's immortal soul mm -hmm. and the ultimate, uh, attainment of everlasting life, the whole reason for, for our, our having been created? I guess when you boil it down, you can, you can define fraternity as just be nice, <laughs> just be nice to each other. I mean, that's, that's kind of what they're saying. Right. That's what it, what it seems to be. And, you know, we have to be nice to each other at the expense even of, of the teaching of the truth. So if the truth is, is too difficult for people, well, we just sort of sweep it under the rug and, and don't talk about it. Right. 
and beyond that, there's there's not any mention in in what Pope Francis is saying about uh, this missionary charity. About you, you mentioned that before about bringing people to salvation. That right. is charity. That that's what we should be concerned about with fraternity, with brotherhood, uh, and that's missing. Right to just avoid arguing with people and and uh, you know doing an occasional uh, phil- phil- philanthropic work is not it's not real charity. It's it, this this cannot be a driving force for for any sort of unity in the world. Just everyone be nice to each other. You know, right. and St. Pius the Tenth in in our apostolic mandate is is very clear on the subject. He says there is no genuine fraternity outside Christian charity. Everything else is a, it's a counterfeit. And he says, through the love of God and his son, Jesus Christ, Christian charity embraces all men, comforts all, but he says, and leads all to the same faith and heavenly happiness. And that's the, that's the foundation of, of, of real charity. We are all children of God meant to attain that, that, that everlasting life in union with God. And how's that fraternity working out for us today? Oh, very uh, nice. You know, right. <laughs> Everything's everything is going great right now. Yeah. Um, so it's this it's this false brotherhood. It's this false fraternity. Um, and like you mentioned uh, towards the beginning, Father, these revolutionary ideas they're they're, they're packed in these slogans with these nice sounding words. And right. but that's sounds, really it. It sounds like a good yeah. We'll 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 all be brothers. We'll all get along. It'll it'll be great. But what's what's that founded on? And that's that's where they're going to to bring in this question of uh, human dignity so okay. that we all, everyone recognizing our common human dignity, we're going to work for a better world. We're going to have this, this common brotherhood as, as members of the human race, all working for the same goals of uh, an earthly utopia. Right. And human dignity that is a real thing. It's a Catholic notion. And, Absolutely. But it, but it's not this human dignity that has been thrown around today. It's it's that we're created in the image and likeness of God. Exactly. So we we if our if our dignity is not founded in that, what what is it founded on? Mm-hmm. So if we just say, uh, you know, man has this tremendous dignity, well, like, okay, prove it <laughs> for what? Right. Exactly. Right. And if if someone denies it, then he can you know he can. It's gratuitously asserted. He can gratuitously deny it. Certainly, no, we don't have any dignity. Um, but there's this elevation of, of man, and this is—it's again—it's a, it's a modernist thing. Man is is the pinnacle, if you want, of, of everything that we can see. He's the he's the center. Everything has to revolve around him. Look at his tremendous dignity. He has the the power even to to make his own truth, to to make religion, to to come to his own understandings about God and have those be valid, whatever that may mean. So right. it's, this is, you know, going back to the, the, the pre-revolutionary philosophers who are you know, founding this, this human dignities on itself, effectively. Right. This is a, when we get down to it, our, our, our human dignity is reliant on God. We are, we are more dignified as immortal creatures when we are, when we submit ourselves to, to God, not to ourselves. Right. God is greater than we are. And in our submission our, to God, we are, we're, we're elevated. That mm-hmm. his, his grace raises up us to a participation in his life. With, without his grace, we, we remain on the purely natural level, but not even the purely natural level because we're limited by original sin. We've lost our dignity by, by sin. We have, we're, we have wounds and then our actual sins make that those problems worse. We were turned away from that higher goal in which we find the, our real worth and dignity. Right. If we, if we take a step back, father, and we look at, look at this example of the Sion started with the best of intentions, uh-huh. uh, but then they started to kind of dive into modernist ideas. Um, how is it that, you know, if let's say we wanted to start another Sion today in 2021 uh what were some what are some things that you would tell us to look out for you know don't don't follow the, these same mistakes and we know that they they got into modernism but what would be some advice that you would give a see on of 2021 today there has to be a, a primacy of doctrine and of truth 
So there, it can't be just about practical things because then we run the risk of, of making the practical, the more important. So mm-hmm. then we have the, what we're doing practically begins to influence what we, we say and do and believe doctrinally. And that, that's a serious problem uh, right. because we want to make the thing work somehow. And so we start fudging the doctrine to make it work. And, you know, that our, the commitment to the, the faith has to be absolute as well. We, we can't play down the faith because it might offend certain people. We don't have to be deliberately offensive. We don't have to sure. say it in the, in the harshest way possible, but we have to point out the truth. You know, we can't just say, well, you're a good guy. So stay where you are, do what you do. You bring your contribution to this, this greater goal. We have to say, you know, you certainly do have good qualities and whatever, but to save your soul, to, to enter into the, the perfection, even of, of human society here below, you need to be a member of the Catholic church and in the state of grace. And we do a great disservice to, to non-Catholics by downplaying that truth. That's the most essential thing for their eternal happiness, but also for their happiness here below. We can't have a, a, an ideal society or as close as human beings can get to an ideal society without the influence of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and of the teaching of his church. And, and the reason I ask that, Father, and, and this, is a, this is a little bit off script from what we were planning on talking about today, but the reason I ask that is that there's, there's so many Catholics who are rightly horrified about the events of our social condition today, you know, this past year, this year, you know, and, and, and before, and I'm trying to, you know, how, what, what can we do as, as Catholics to, um, to, to make things right or make things better, at least right. in society. And, and what do we take from the Sion that's, that's appropriate and what do we take that's not? Right. Well, naturalistic solutions are, non-solutions. They're, they're uh, not going to lead us to the answer. You can perhaps have a, you know, a temporary improvement, but society needs our Lord Jesus Christ. There, there's no getting around that. We can, you know, we can look for political saviors and in, in individuals or in parties. And there are certainly some that are better than others and what have you, but it's not the answer. The answer is, is our Lord and his teaching and the proper influence of his, of his church in her, Full glory, not kowtowing to uh, to modern ideals, but but teaching what she's always taught uh, unabashedly. That's that's going to lead to to a better society for all of us. Right. You know, I mean, and we can contrast the world before the church had an, an influence to what it was afterwards, and you, all of the good things that the church accomplished in uh, in human society. The, the abolition of slavery it did not exist. In, in Europe for, for nearly a thousand years. And it's only a turning away from the church of the Renaissance where you see it come back. And uh, you know, the elevation of the position of women, the, the church is always a, you know, attacked for being um, you know, chauvinistic in regard to women and so on. And, and it's not true. Women were treated as property before the, the church pointed out their real dignity and in, in particularly in reference to the Blessed Virgin Mary. So the, the, the answer is always going to be in, in the teaching of, of our Lord Jesus Christ and and his church. And the church has a, a real social doctrine that is capable of reforming the world. But that assumes that, that we're trying to bring people to become actual members of, of the church so that they can participate in the grace that helps them to live in a society of that, that sort as well. It, it, it has to be supernatural. It can't even be a, a sort of naturalistic application of, of church principle. Right. And so if you and so if you try to attract people using documents like Fratelli Tutti that is rooted in naturalism, it's just it's going to miss the mark entirely. Right. Just all being nice to each other and having this sort of vague sense of solidarity as as citizens of the world uh, is is not going to get us where we need to be. That's we've got we've got plenty of that going on and have for the last 250 years at least. And it's a disaster. You know, the the, the social ills now are. Um, in certain areas, are, are things are worse than they were before the coming of our Lord. We yeah. just think about the crime of abortion. Right. Amen. A women. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <Lord> help us. <laughs> <laughs> well, Father, thank you so much for taking the time to to chat with us about this. This was uh, this was eye opening, um, and it was great to be able to compare, you know, 
very similar documents in terms of, you know, social doctrine, um, but one from Pius X, one from Pope Francis. And we can see how, how Pope St. Pius X, in effect, condemned everything that Pope St. Saint, or Pope St. Francis, now I'm doing it, Pope Francis <laughs> is doing uh, in 2020. So thank you. We appreciate it very much, Father. That's my pleasure. And I would certainly invite anybody, you know, if we think we're, who thinks we're exaggerating to, to read both documents. Uh, they're, the, the contrast is, is, is striking. And we really see in, in St. Pius X what the church has always taught and what is the, the key to the, to the reform of the, uh, of our social life and of the, of the world in general. Absolutely. Father, thanks for your time. We will be chatting again soon. All right. All God right. bless you. too. Thank you for listening to and watching episode 14 of our Crisis in the Church series here on SSPX Podcast. In episode 15, we are excited to have Father Dominique Bourmeau join us for the first time as we look at the concept of existentialism, which is the idea that progress, change, and evolution are necessary to find the truth, and how this concept has taken over our society and the church. If you have a question on the topic of the crisis, please feel free to ask it at sspxpodcast.com slash crisis. Please share this episode with someone who you think might enjoy it. And if they don't know what a podcast is, please show them so that they can take advantage of all our episodes. And if you have the ability to set up a monthly recurring donation of 5 or 10 or $20 on sspxpodcast.com, it would help us immensely to complete this Crisis in the Church project. Also, please rate and review this podcast on whatever podcast app you're using. Until next week, thank you for listening, and God bless you.